The decade of the 50s arrived, and with it, a post-war baby boom. Radio was still king. Terry Deer's Amateur Hour was a huge hit. The arrival of Ernest Ward's 1950 English team aboard the Himalaya and the tour that followed can be viewed in retrospect as a watershed for the Australian game. The tourist's first match against New South Wales drew a record 70,419 crowd to the SCG. It was to be blue skipper Johnny Hawke's last game of the season. He had been tipped to Captain Australia, but a badly injured knee put paid to that. That very night it was announced that Clive Churchill would captain the Australian team. Plagued by bad weather, the first test was played on the SCG pitch that resembled a paddy field. British winger Jack Hilton scored two tries. The tour scraped home 6-4. To Brisbane and the second test on a dry track saw a strong but battered Australian side pull off a 15-3 win to level the series. And so to Sydney and continuous rain. Notwithstanding, fans began arriving as early as 7am for the decider. So bad was the pitch that it required the spreading of 40 tonnes of sand. The crowd of 45,000 was to witness a contest as stirry and as close as any in football history. Not surprisingly, in the quagmire conditions, the first half was trialless. Goals to Churchill and Ward saw the scores locked at 2 all. The struggle was grim and unrelenting. The water bucket, in increasing use, 15 minutes from the end came the decisive blow as the ball sweeps out to winger Ron Roberts. The Aussies hold on to win 5-2 and with it the Ashes for the first time in 30 years. The crowd goes wild. Players, fans and officials dance in the mud and Captain Churchill is chaired from the field. Australia's halfback, Keith Holman, recalls the emotions that overflowed. I was crying and uh... It was one of those things that you never forget. Uh, we had mud in our eyes and they wouldn't know if he was crying or not, but I think every one of us were crying because most of us were young fellas. Ron Roberts would never forget the reaction on that day. The crowd had walked all over the cricket ground, looked at the mud heap and went, then went over in front of the grandstands cheering and screaming and going on and it was bedlam. Great credit was also given to coach Vic Hay. A test man that day, Bernie Purcell was part of the South's juggernaut that won the grand final 21-15 over Wests. Some things never changed. The thump of the drum as Jimmy Sharman's boxing troupe came to town each Easter. The Interstate Series of 51 produced the first Queensland Series win since 1940, but it was the arrival of the fabulous Frenchman that truly stole the show. Their focal point was the diminutive chain-smoking captain, Puy Gobert, with his uncanny goal-kicking ability. Here in the first test in Sydney, he landed seven goals from all over the place. It was the Frenchman's dazzling switches of play and quick passing that enthralled the crowd. They won the test 26 to 15. Australia turned it around to win the second in Brisbane and then the decider in Sydney, attracting 67,000 fans. Inspired by the powerful second rower, L.A. Bruce, the tourists bewildered Australia. Stand-in halfback Jean Crespo scored three of their seven tries. The result, a stunning 35-14 triumph, and the Frenchman rejoiced. Australian front rower Duncan Hall remembers Puy Gobert's special philosophy. Well, he was a great player, except, but not the fence. He claimed that all them blokes in front of him, he said, no, they're there to tackle. He said, me, just kick goals and do this and run with the ball or something like that. And uh, <laughs> that was his theory. Manley's victory over St George in the final of 51 won for them a grand final berth. A Manly try scorer that day was the young halfback Ken Arthurson. But South's trounced the Northsiders 42 to 14 in the decider. Johnny Graves ran in four tries. I'm a buddy. I'm a weed, so what? If you would let me spend my whole life loving you. In Australia, there were new crazes and new words and new dances to learn. Travis Hardwick's New Zealand team arrived to enliven the 1952 season. More than 56,000 people saw Australia win the first test here in Sydney. 
but then a Kiwi turnaround. They won the next two tests to take the series. Critics were unenthusiastic about the chances of the 52 Kangaroos as they left for England. But they did better than many anticipated, losing the three tests but winning the bulk of the remaining games of a gruelling 40-match tour. In France, the Roos lost the test series in three tough encounters. Yet the return clashes between Churchill and Aubert provided great highlights. Churchill, in the mid-80s, reflected fondly on that tour. Of course, um, being captain, I was only 23, you know, yeah. and taking a team to England was a, one of the best thrills I've ever had. 1952 produced one of the most infamous of all grand finals between Wests and Souths. From South's point of view, referee George Bishop was a figure of great concern that day. Remarkably, Bishop ruled this fair try-making pass from Threlfo to South's second row McGreedy forward and disallowed the try. There had been talk of betting on the match and of dark deeds. Bishop made several more highly contentious decisions which went against South's. West won 22 to 12, but South's captain Jack Rayner has his own blunt view of events of that day. We weren't allowed to win, that's what I'd say. The way we were treated today, I said you got life in racing for that treatment that was handed out to us today. The penalties and the, the offside or forward pass that didn't take place. I never ever spoke to the referee again. The match was referee Bishop's last. For West coach, the ex-referee Tom McMahon, it was a significant achievement in his only season as a coach. In November 1952, Jimmy Carruthers' first round KO of bantamweight champ Vic Tauil saw him return home as Australia's first world boxing champion. Mike Dimitro's American All-Stars were both the big attraction and the big flop of season 1953. For a collection of college footballers who had never played rugby league, they managed to generate huge interest. 65,000 turned out to watch them play against a very benevolent Sydney team. The standard didn't match the hype. Souths were back on top that year, thrashing St George 31-12 in the grand final, with Ian Moyer scoring three tries. The Australian team, captained by Clive Churchill, rated themselves unlucky to lose the Test Series against New Zealand. They won seven matches of the nine games on the Kiwi campaign, but lost the first two Tests before taking the third in Auckland 18-16. The high spirits in New Zealand that year were dashed on Christmas Day when a packed holiday train plunged into the upper Wanaehu River at night, leaving 166 people dead. In Australia, Queen Elizabeth was greeted by a vast throng when she arrived aboard the Royal Yacht. The arrival of the Dickie Williams-led British Lions provided the highlight of the 54 winter. In the first test, the Australians were on fire, running in seven tries, romping home 37 to 12. Changes were called for, and the British found the man for the occasion in 19-year-old Welsh rugby convert Billy Boston. When I got to Australia, uh, I couldn't even play the ball, so we was, used to go in the corridors of the, of the hotel and learn me how to play the ball. And, uh, and I played, I made my debut in the second test in Brisbane. Uh, it was a, a dream come true. What an impact Boston made, scoring two tries as he helped Great Britain turn it around. A memorable moment for Australia was a piece of Brian Carlson individual brilliance. The tourists' 38 to 21 victory levelled the series. The second of the New South Wales versus Great Britain matches has its special place in the Hall of Infamy. Referee Orb Oxford abandoned a disgraceful game, leaving the players to it as they brawled around him. The deciding third test, seven days later, was devoid of the thuggery that had shamed rugby league and turned out to be a magnificent contest. O'Grady and Williams tries had Australia trailing 8-0, but Churchill and Wells combined to send Brisbane's Alex Watson racing for the line. Minutes later, Diversi crossed, and then after the break, Wells scored a disputed try before setting up one for Pitting out wide, who later found himself admonished by coach Vic Hay. Well, Dickie Williams come racing at me, went to put me on a coat angle when I stepped off my left foot and stepped inside him and scored under the post. <laughs> Vic said, when you get over that line, put the ball down. I said, it's all right for you, Vic, but I've got to kick the goals. 
And he says, oh, well, oh, do what you want to do. <laughs> Australia got home in a thrilling and tight encounter, 20 points to 16. Another triumph for skipper Clive Churchill. Souths did it again in 54 by downing Newtown in the Premiership decider. A vital cog in those days was Lock Chickacowie. You just had to play at your top and your peak and produce things and do things that you never dreamt of doing and to sort of be part and parcel of the side, you thought you were letting them down if you didn't do your share, you know. Churchill was chosen as captain for Rugby League's first World Cup in 1954. For the Aussies, it was an unsuccessful campaign. The final, played at Lyon, was won by the Dave Valentine-led Great Britain over France. Not far away, 80 people died when three cars ploughed into the grandstand on the Le Mans circuit. In the States, this bridge was not a good place to be. And back home, floodwaters surged through the streets of the township of Maitland, killing a dozen people and leaving thousands homeless. It was 1955, and the days of the six o'clock swirl were at an end. The touring 1955 Frenchmen were painfully slow to get rolling, despite flashes of flamboyance. After losing the first test, they managed to square the series up in the second. A sellout crowd of over 62,000 was treated to a thriller in the decider played in Sydney. A Brian Davies try, and then one in reply by Raymond Contraston, saw Australia lead 5-3 at the break. Playing it hard and tough on the heavy pitch, the Frenchman hit the front when André Ducard scored. Duplay's penalty goal made it 8-5, and in the tense final minutes, France managed to hold on. Season 55 saw the most sustained exhibition of will to win ever seen. South's Bernie well, Purcell was part of it. Second last to last after the first game of the second round. And to win the competition, we had to win every game from there. Every game was a grand final, not the last one, but every one. South's epic clash with Manly is remembered for Clive Churchill's heroism, soldiering on under excruciating pain with a broken wrist, and then at the end, the task of converting Chicka Cowie's try. That fabulous goal from wide out broke the deadlock. The miracle of 55 climaxed on grand final day, when the Rabbitohs triumphed by a point over a gutsy Newtown. Soon after, crybaby crooner Johnny Ray arrived to a huge reception at Sydney Airport. And so did Frank Sinatra, accompanied by his daughter Nancy. In 1956, the Kiwis proved a handful in the three-test series. Led by Ken Carney, Australia scraped home in the first two tough encounters, but was more convincing in the third. At Wimbledon, it was an all-Aussie final between the Golden Boys Lou Hode and Ken Rosewall, with Hode winning in four sets. A spectacular 36-33 loss to Balmain in the 56 final ended South's reign. The grand final, Saints and Balmain, was the doorstep to history for the Dragons, who were gradually gathering players of magnificent calibre. St George got home by 18 to 12. Proven, Wilson and Bugden were three of the many Saints stars that day. It was a triumph for Captain Ken Carney. Melbourne hosted an unforgettable Olympic Games, and suddenly the country had an army of new heroes and heroines, such as the golden girl Betty Cuthbert and the queen of the pool Dawn Fraser. Ken Carney was chosen to lead the 56 Kangaroos. Big Billy Boston was unstoppable, and the Roos were well beaten here in the first test at Wigan. Their moment of glory came when they won the second at Bradford, but in the decider at Swindon, they were soundly beaten. This is television. Good evening and welcome to television. 1957 and Australia hosted the second World Cup. The men in green and gold, captained by Newtown's Dick Poole, didn't lose a match. One of nine Gordon Clifford goals and Ray Ritchie's spectacular try represent a glimpse of the four successive thrashings handed out by New South Wales to the Maroons as the gap widened between the two states. Harry Bath, back from Warrington, was the masterstroke signing by St George that year. 
His eight goals and a superb performance by Brian Clay in the grand final paved the way for a 31-9 hammering of Manly, coached by Ken Arthurson. In 1958, Brian Henderson's bandstand was launched. See you later, Australia. Bye now. Football season 58 brought Alan Prescott and his Great Britain team to Australia. Their encounter with New South Wales was not far short of referee Orb Oxford's infamous walk-off match in 54. In the touring side was the legendary second row of Vince Karelius, number 21, known as the Wild Bull of the Pampas. Loads of stick and, and prior to the game of course a, a tremendous amount of feeling because test matches, like I said, test matches are war and, uh, and the atmosphere is electric and the first tackle, God bless it, everything, everything went into it. But it was great, I loved it. You know, I mean, I love the old gladiator approach when we just going in and there's a, you know, there's a body or two lying about and makes the job a bit more interesting. As New South Wales and the British battled it out, Karelius was sent off for kicking Bruce Olive. Rex Moss had got his marching orders after a dust up on the far wing. Greg Haywick followed, then Peter Diamond for kneeing an opponent. Mossop describes the slather and whack of those days. They were incredibly hard men, tough men, and everybody tackled high. Everybody tackled around the head. There was no, no crime in it in that era, you know, whack him, get in and give him some. And that was the way you used to be calling out to each other, give him some, give him some, you know. Suspensions to Karelius, Diamond and Haywick cost them places in the first test at the SCG. The brilliance of Wells set up this try to Brian Carlson. Australia's forward pack of O'Shea, Mossop, Proven, Marsh and Carney and Captain Davies were in command. Australia won 25-8. A shining light for the tourists was 5-8th Dave Bolton. The Great Britain camp was in a deadly serious mood in the build-up to the second test in Brisbane. Prescott recalls the ultimatum delivered by the colourful team manager, Tom Mitchell. And he said, any man falling out of line, doing anything he shouldn't do, he be in bed late or drinking, he will be sent home immediately. And there's no player ever yet been sent home. With Karelius back, England was primed and ready. In the first five minutes, skipper Prescott went in hard to tackle Kel O'Shea and came out clutching a broken right arm. Twelve minutes later, Dave Bolton departed with a broken collarbone. But Britain refused to wilt. Prescott, his right arm dangling uselessly, their inspiration. Further injuries eroded the British cause, but lifted by the ferocity of McTeague and Karelius's play and the dazzling running of cocky young halfback Alex Murphy, Britain always had the upper hand and won 25-18. It was a day Murphy would never forget. Yeah, I was running on, uh, on four-star petrol then. I think um, I just started to uh, believe that I was going to be a good player. Um, I know a lot of people said, well, You've always known that, but um, I think on, on the tour, I matured. The Ashes Cup was up for grabs a fortnight later at the SCG. The injured Davy Bolton could only watch and cheer from the grandstand. A try to Ike Southwood. Australia was in the thick of it. A try to Proven. An individual try to Keith Yappy Holman, and the score close at half-time. 14-12 in Great Britain's favour. But the real class that day belonged to the Brits. Here, just one of three tries scored by Wigan winger Mike Sullivan. A smashing 40 points to 17 victory. Prescott's 58 Lions had outclassed their opposition to win the Ashes for the first time in 12 years on Australian soil. On the Premiership front, West's, the Millionaires, their ranks bolstered by the most ambitious buying program in the club's history, which had drawn such champions as Kel O'Shea, Harry Wells and Peter Diamond, were rated a chance of toppling St George in the grand final. It was the intercept try by Bobby Bugden that sunk West's. Saints got home 20 points to nine. A depleted South struggled, finishing eighth that year. When officials inexplicably halved Clive Churchill's bonus, the greatest player of his time quit the club and headed north. In 59, a young American crash-tackled his way into the ladies' hearts. Oh, oh, boom, boom, baby, you're the one I adore. 
and Saints had a new backline sensation, Reg Gaznier. The Saints had also lured across from Newtown a young forward named Johnny Raper, whose career was to follow the same meteoric path as Gaznier's. For Clive Churchill in 59, there was the satisfaction of masterminding Queensland to an interstate series win against the team of which he had been such a fixture part for years. Churchill also coached the Australian team, which scraped home in the series against Cliff Johnson's New Zealanders 2-1. In this, the second test in Brisbane, Reg Gaznier sends Ian Moyer over for one of his three tries. St George tackled Manly in a fiery grand final in which Harry Bath and Rex Mossop were sent off. St George won easily, 20 nil. With Keith Barnes captain and Rex Mossop his deputy, the Kangaroos of 1959 had a fresh and exciting look about them. The legendary Dave Brown wishes Barnes and his team good luck and farewell at a gala dinner. May you be blessed with good fortune and a safe return to each and every one of you to your home folks. We have a very young side, but one that I am sure that with the experience we'll receive overseas, will improve and become a very good side. The tour provided the classic confrontation between the two superpowers of World Rugby League. The first test at Swinton belonged to Reg Gaznier. In his test debut, the dynamic centre scored three tries and the Clive Churchill coached Australians won 22-14. Gasney's rival that day was the classic English centre, Eric Ashton. I've never seen a centre as fast anywhere, ever. Uh, I remember first watching him in the Sydney Colts in 58, but it was no surprise to me that he came over in 59. He was a devastating player. The second test in the gloom at Headingley was a classic of its type. A try by Neil Fox. Harry Wells engineers a Brian Carlson try. And then a crucial kick by Carlson, hitting the upright. It was to have a major bearing on the outcome. Controversy. Wells to Gaznier. Carlson to Muir, who heads for the line. But the pass from Gaznier to Carlson is ruled forward by referee Ron Gilder. Harry Wells was infuriated. After the game, I, I was that uh, upset about it. All I happened to say to the referee, he robbed us. And he said, Harry, he said, i got to live here. And I said, oh, well, fair enough. With Australia ahead 10-6, Ashton kicks through and Gaznier gathers, but is caught behind the line and not short of it. The Kangaroos believe the ruling should have been a line dropout, but instead, Gelder orders a five-yard scrum. It turns out to be critical. A sleight of hand try to British lock Johnny Whiteley. If you're an Englishman, you, you know, you always see that the Australians are always biased and, and, and vice versa. And it all, it all gels to make him, you know, what rugby league test match is all about. It, it puts the spice on it. The Whiteley try was converted by Neil Fox and Great Britain were home 11-10, levelling the series. The settling of the Ashes came down to a dour struggle on a grey day at Wigan Central Park. Here a British try to Neil Fox after what seemed to be a blatant knock-on by Jack Wilkinson. Now one of Test football's greatest moments as Gaznia set up a try for Brian Carlson. Beat for Australia. Well played. A great try by... He's trying to go around behind the post for a goal. Behind for most of the game, the Australians clawed back to 15-12. But a late handling mistake enabled Whiteley to hand winger Ike South with this gift of a try. To wrap up the test and the Ashes. Australia's Ian Walsh remains critical of the refereeing that day. They brought in Sergeant Major Clay to beat us in that third one. There's no doubt about it. He was a very hard referee and he let the Englishman get away with a lot that day. But then we've got to think the same thing can be said out here with Darcy Lawler, a good old mate of mine. Darcy hated the Poms and, and I, I think on a couple of occasions we, we did get square with them out here. The dynamic team of 1959 clean swept the Test Series in France and set the foundations for what lay ahead. In 1959, a sad ending to the 50s, with the death of rugby league's master, Dally Messenger.